we looked at standard quasi Newton algorithms and I, uh, I, I showed you a little bit about what uh, wh why they are called quasi Newton because they approximate the Hessian and then the big the big thing really the, the, the observation that totally revolutionized optimization was this observation that when you are approximating any way why do not you approximate the inverse Hessian uh, instead of the Hessian and once you realize that you can approximate the inverse Hessian then these updates become really simple there is a matrix vector product at every iteration and then you, you, can, you can update your parameters and you can do a line search and everything happens. Now the question that must be burning in your mind and I am sure many of you thought about this in the break I am sure is all about how do you find this approximation, how do you find this BT, right? how, where did this beast come from and how do you find it. It turns out that the way you find this BT is by a very simple, um, well it is it's, it's, it's by a, when I describe it it seems a little bit convoluted but actually it makes more sense. So the way the BT is derived is as follows, so before we get into how the BT is derived let me, let me show you how, what is the philosophy behind it. So the philosophy behind how BT is derived is you look at this model. Right, so you say okay, let me, I have this particular model of my objective function, what do I want my model to satisfy? I want my model to satisfy two conditions in some sense that is sort of what, what they impose or what they came up with. The first condition is to say the, the gradient of the model must match the gradient of my objective function at the current location. So if I, at, if I evaluate my model at Wt. Right, so if I evaluate mt of w at wt then it must be the case that I get my the gradient of this model must be the true gradient of my objective function. In other words it must be gradient of j at wt okay, and you can clearly see once you set w equals wt and you take the gradient and then set w equals wt you more or less can immediately see that you get the gradient which is not very surprising. Sort of the other thing they say is that after I take a step. I should still, so if I evaluate this model at wt plus 1, it should still be the case that the gradient that I get out of this model should match the gradient of my true objective function. So in other words, if I evaluate this model at wt plus 1, then the gradient that I should get out of this should be gradient of j at wt plus 1, okay. So if you want to ensure that condition, you take a, let me actually write this down a little bit hard. This is what happens when you make slides at 2 a.m. in the morning, you do not write all the things that you need to write. Okay. So let us take our model. Okay. So now this is your model at w and let us take the gradient of our model. Okay. So if you, if you write out the gradient with respect to w, the gradient is simply this term vanishes okay. and then you just get gradient of j at wt plus ht w minus wt, clear? So this is the gradient of our model. Now let me evaluate this gradient at wt. If I evaluate this gradient at wt clearly I get back the gradient of my function, right? this is clear. Now let me try to evaluate this model at wt plus 1. Okay, if I evaluate the gradient of this model at wt plus 1, I get that gradient j at wt plus ht wt plus 1 minus wt. Now, one of the things that BFGS assumes is it says I want the gradient of my model at wt plus 1 to match the gradient of my objective function at wt plus 1. Right? So this is, a, this is a modeling assumption. So this is saying I want my model gradient to be equal to the gradient of my objective function. 
Okay, so this is sort of makes sense, right? You say, oh, all I know is I know what is my current location, I know what my gradient is, I I am making a building a model, and the model should respect the uh, the gradient at the new location as well. So sort of this is just ensuring that there is two step match in the in the model. Once you do this, once you make this a requirement, you can immediately see that you want the following condition to hold. You want W t plus one minus W t must be equal to H t inverse of gradient of j at W t plus one minus gradient of j at W t. Okay. So this condition, this condition is called the second equation. Okay. And so what? BFGS does is it says find for me a new matrix B, okay, which means update my model of the inverse Hessian, but do not go too far away from where I was. Okay. But what do I mean by how do I measure too far away? Okay. This is where the secret sauce comes in, which is you use a weighted norm. This weighted norm has a very convoluted way of uh, of describing it, it depends on the average Hessian on the path between WT plus 1 plus WT. I will spare you the details for now. You can look it up I mean, a very well written book by Nosidal and Wright and you can look it up. So I will spare you because that is not the important part of what we are going to talk about. Okay. But basically you have a weighted norm which tells you how you measure distance and this weighted norm is sort of cooked up secretly and then subject to this condition, right? to this condition. So this is your displacement in parameter space and this is your displacement in gradient space. Right? So you see this and this right? and you say that ST is equal to B times YT. This is exactly the second equation. Okay? The secret sauce of course is how do you come up with this weighted vector W and sort of there is a, there is a motivation for it which comes from the average Hessians and if you choose the right weighted measure it turns out that the update formula basically looks like this. Okay. The formula looks horrible, but what, what do you need to think, what is it that is in it for you? From a practical perspective, what is, in, what is a, a, a big advantage of this formula is that you have your previous matrix BT. Okay. This is identity minus a rank 1 vector, rank 1 matrix. So you deflate BT, so you sort of project it into a smaller space, one dimensional lower space, okay? rank 1 deflation and then you add a rank 1 back to it. Okay? So this is nothing but a rank 2 update to BT plus 1 and it turns out that this is really, really efficient to do because this is only order n square per iteration, okay? very easy, very, very fast. So therefore this is an efficient update to how your BT plus 1 looks like. Okay, you can keep on updating this at every iteration. There is a question? Was it? Okay. Okay. And, but this still does not solve the problem of what happens if your number of parameters is large. Say if you want to apply BFGS to something like RCV1, you cannot do it because BT plus 1 is going to be a 50,000 by 50,000 matrix you cannot store a 50,000 by 50,000 matrix in memory. So, so even though this whole algorithm was invented in the 70s, uh, uh, on one end they did not have that, that, that large computers, so they were still solving small problems. For small problems actually BFGS works extremely well, it is a very well behaved, very nice algorithm, but it could not scale to really large problems. The big breakthrough in BFGS came in 1994 where Nosidal and, and co-workers came up with a limited memory variant. So what is a limited memory variant? The idea is really, really simple. You take your B matrix right, and you write it as some diagonal matrix D plus a matrix which is tall and skinny times a matrix which is tall and skinny. So in other words, this is like Z, Z transpose. Okay. So suppose you have a problem. So this is a diagonal matrix. Okay. So this is diagonal. The diagonal matrix requires order D storage, okay. nothing else. This Z matrix 
looks like this. So this is z has d rows and some small number k columns. Usually k is I think by default BFGS sets it to 15. So it's a 15 by d dimensional matrix. Okay. And this is an order D storage. So the overall storage is order D as opposed to if you had to store B exactly, you'd have to store D square. Of course, this is not exact. You can only do an approximation. Okay. Uh, you, you can vary this. There is a little bit of uh, variation, but more or less we find that just setting it to some reasonable number between 5 to 15 almost always works. So you don't have to worry about this as much. Okay, so you just you reduce your storage requirements from order d square to order d, which means for BFG, for something like RCV one, you have to store ten rows of fifty thousand dimensions each. Big deal, you can do that. Okay, so that is this is sort of the big breakthrough that happened in in optimization once they invented this limited memory variant, and whenever you call any sort of function minimization without really specifying anything, by default, you're always calling this version. Right? So this version is called LBFGS. Okay. Now let's see. Yes, yeah, so it's basically it is motivated more or less by computational requirements, but also it is motivated by actually uh, this is true in in machine learning that intrinsic dimensions of the problems are not very hard. So sort of you can think of the low rank approximation as taking advantage of the fact that the intrinsic dimension is not that hard. So if you remember what Alex Gray was talking about, things like KD trees are not supposed to work in high dimensions, but they actually work because the intrinsic dimension of the problem is very small. The same sort of thing happens here, I mean, in a very vague, very non-scientific way of explaining it, okay? Okay, so this is, this is what BFG, so this is the updates to BFGS, and then one last thing which I did not, uh, which I still have to specify, to specify to the full algorithm, is that you have to do a line search, okay? The line search is basically you take your current parameter, you are given a direction d, and you are going along this direction d. The line search usually, uh, there, are, there are certain conditions that you need to meet in a line search. So the conditions that you meet are called the Wolf conditions. And basically, the, they, they are much more easily explained if I, if I draw a figure. So the Wolf condition says, this is your first order tail approximation right, to your function. You take this first order tail approximation and you pump it up a little bit. So sort of go a little bit higher, okay? This point where it intersects the function should give you an upper bound on the step size. Sort of it's saying don't step too far away from where you are. Be, be within range, okay? And the other condition is saying you spent a lot of time finding this direction. Don't take too small a step. So the way they do it is they take they evaluate a first order, uh, first order uh, Taylor approximation to the convex function at this location and they ensure that the slope is at least some value. So in other words, it says, so the, the, the curvature condition sort of says, don't take too small a step. The sufficient decrease condition takes, don't take too large a step. And then more or less, you would search for a good step inside this region. Okay, between where the green point intersects and where the red line intersects. Are we still only talking about context? Yeah, we are still talking, although uh, this is one of, the, one of the beauties of BFGS is that it actually works even for non-convex functions extremely well, but we are still talking about convex. And also we are restricting ourselves to smooth for so far. So this, this is basically it says that your gradient at, at where, you, where you step to must at least be some constant times the gradient from where you started. Sort of this is the directional gradient. So this is like you, you must at least get, see here the gradient is negative, right? So you want to at least take a, a, a large enough step that you sort of have decrease your objective function to a certain value. Right? So the slope has to be at least 
a certain value, a certain constant times where you started from. Uh, for the low rank matrix, yes, so you can do that. So when you have a low rank matrix, actually this all this becomes really simple. So you, you just have to update one stride of the matrix. So it's, it's uh, much more efficient, yeah. Uh, again, you know, the, the reason why I don't spend as much time explaining to you BFGS is more or less if you wanted to use BFGS, you should never try to code one yourself. Right? And there are very, very good implementations available and more or less you should just go and use one of those. But what I want to do is build upon them. I mean, I want you to get the intuition across and then I will build upon this, okay? So that's why if you just want to use plain vanilla BFGS, never code one, please, please, please. This is one of the strict no-nos just like not inverting a matrix, just go and get a good one. There are people who spend their lives implementing BFGS, okay? So you don't want to do that. You want to do machine learning, <laughs> at least hopefully. <laughs> Okay. So, so, the, so these are the two conditions that you need to satisfy and you do a line search and you try to take a step which is reasonably good, okay? Uh, again, remember that th this is all happening in one dimension just because my direction is fixed and then you remember I showed you in the first day that when your direction is fixed and you look along any direction for a convex function, you'll see a convex function. So you'll see a function which looks like this, okay? Okay, good. So this is sort of the intuition. So the take home message from the classical BFGS is that it's an algorithm which tries to approximate the Hessian, okay? And it does a pretty good job of approximating the Hessian and then it has some magic secret sauce for how to, appro uh, how to update the inverse Hessian estimate that it has at every point, okay? Now, what happens though is that when you, oh, and uh, one more thing to mention because we talked briefly about the uh, rates of convergence. It, for plain BFGS, not the limited memory variant, but plain BFGS, you can show that if your function is reasonable and so on and so forth, you can get log log one over epsilon iterations. So it's basically ultra fast, okay? Which is more or less the same as the Newton method. On the other hand, if you do a limited memory variant, the rates drop down to log one or epsilon. Still so linear, slightly more than super, in practice, slightly more than super linear, but uh, you get, in theory, you get only something like log rates of convergence, okay? Still pretty fast. Now let's go to what happens when you're trying to use, when you have non-smooth problems, right? So this is what we are interested in. So BFGS, of course, assumes that uh, it is a very, very critical assumptions everywhere built into BFGS. I'll show you where things break down. We'll systematically go through them. But critically, at the heart of BFGS is this assumption that somehow the objective function is smooth. And therefore, you can compute a gradient. You can do all sorts of nice things with, with that objective function. However, we are working with things like the hinge loss, right? And our hinge loss, of course, is not differentiable. So what do you do? You call Husserl. <laughs> Never a problem. <laughs> okay, and hopefully they'll they'll send somebody to fix it. <laughs> okay. So again, let me remind you again of subgradients. This is a recurring theme. I know it's <laughs> the third time I'm bringing this up, but again, these are really important concepts. So subgradients, as you know, are are these uh, are these functions which can be used are these vectors which can be used to build a piecewise linear lower bound to the objective function. And we'll denote the set of all subgradients as, uh, as the partial of f at w, okay? Now, before we move on, and I mean, you sort of already got a sense of this, but I want to make this very, very explicit. Why is it that somehow when you deal with a smooth convex function, things are all nice? I mean, you can almost always do optimization properly but when you deal with a non-smooth optimization problem, why is it that hell breaks loose? Why is it so hard? You know, what is the intuition? Why, is it, why are things so hard? So the very first thing that happens in doing non-smooth convex optimization is the following thing. If I take a function like this, look at this subgradient, right? In a smooth convex function, I am always assured of the following fact. If I take a small step in the direction of the negative gradient, my objective function will necessarily decrease. That's the definition of, of, a, of a gradient, right? Uh, either my gradient is zero, in which case nothing happens, I stay where I am, 
or my gradient, if I take a small step in the negative gradient direction, I always will decrease. It may be that I need to take a very small step to see the decrease, but I always see a decrease, again okay, a smooth function. Unfortunately, unfortunately, you cannot say this for a subgradient. In other words, if I take a negative subgradient direction, I cannot tell you that it is a descent direction. In other words, I cannot guarantee to you that I will always decrease my objective function. Here is an extreme case of that. Suppose I am sitting at 0, okay? I pick an arbitrary subgradient. Okay? I take an infinitesimal step in the direction of the subgradient. Immediately my objective function will go up. Okay? Very unfortunate, but that is what life is. So this is the first difficulty. Right? I want to give you a flavor for why, why is it that we spend so much time on doing these non-smooth functions. Another thing that is really sort of, I mean, uh, the, the, the best way to describe this is that uh, the, the function, you cannot trust the function. Right? You remember just like, say in machine learning, you see all these evolutionary concepts come in, right? So when you're doing SVMs, you don't want to, you want to be maximally non-committal. When you are doing non-smooth optimization, you don't want to trust anything. You really want to, you really want to not trust this. Why is that the case? Suppose you're here somewhere, okay? Sort of look around you, the function looks linear. You say, oh, cool, the function looks linear. Let me take a large step. Off you go and take a large step and you end up there. Sort of the function switches directions on you suddenly without telling you that it is switching directions, right? So it abruptly changes directions. This is bad. This is really bad because you do not know, you cannot trust the function, you cannot take large steps, you cannot sort of, you know, do this, do these kind of things that you could do with a smooth function. Because for a smooth function, you more or less know that this abrupt change will not happen. There will be a smooth change. You will, you will be able to detect it. If you sort of look around, you'll be able to see that something is happening. Hey, 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 you know, gradient is going haywire. Something is happening. Here, there is no such signal. You could keep on going and going epsilon close to zero. You would not get a single signal saying that your function is suddenly going to switch. Okay? Got that? The third problem is something that I mentioned before. It is very hard to detect convergence. I cannot use the criterion of just saying, oh, if my subgradient norm goes to zero, uh, then I have converged. Here is again the classic example. I mean, this sort of V function is a fascinating function. You just study it and you understand hundreds of things about non-smooth functions. At zero, the subgradient contains the interval minus one to one. So if I evaluated the subgradient and I got a random number between minus one to one, I would not even know that I am at the optimum. I have no way of figuring out that I am at the optimum. Okay? And this is the other problem. So these are the three key difficulties. You cannot ensure that every step you take will decrease your objective function. You cannot trust your function. Right? And you cannot even detect that you, are, you might be sitting at the optimum. You remember that cup example right? with the, with the coffee cup. You might be sitting at the optimum, but you may not be able to detect that you are sitting at the optimum. Yeah, it could be, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, not all functions are all minimized at zero, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is sort of the whole issue of how things work. Okay. Clear? Now, having said all these things about why it is so difficult, let me also try to convince you that subgradients have some what I call the good, bad, and the ugly properties. Okay. So the good property about subgradients is that the set of all subgradients at a location is always a convex set. This is a really nice property. So again, if you see in your in this case, right, so it's an interval, and interval is a convex set. In general, it is always a convex set. So if you look at the subdifferential set, the set of all possible gradients, subgradients at a point, th this is a convex set. Okay, and then we talked about this just a minute ago. Not every subgradient, so that's a bad property. Right? Not every subgradient gives you a descent direction. Sort of the ugly property is the following. You can write a condition. So you can actually detect whether, whether a direction is a descent direction. OK? 
okay. It is kind of a very ugly condition which says that a direction is a descent direction if and only if it turns out that for every s which belongs to the subgradient set d times s is smaller than 0. When you, when you have a when you have a differentiable co convex function clearly this set contains a singleton which is only the gradient and you just take d to be the negative gradient direction. So, you get negative gradient times gradient which is minus negative gradient square which is always strictly smaller than 0 right. So, this is the this is sort of the ugly condition that you need to check for whenever you want to ensure that you you have a descent direction ok. We, we will do that, we will do, we'll do similar things ok. So, in general if you are given a non-smooth objective function with nothing you know about what the objective function is more or less you are in bad shape right, I mean you cannot do much about it. But again coming back to the same theme, we are not doing general purpose optimization, we are doing optimization for machine learning, we know a lot about what we are working with. So, it is sort of you know intimacy is quite good because you know what you are working with right. <laughs> ok. So, now let us see what happens. So, let us be a bit brave and actually go ahead and see what happens when you run BFGS on a non-smooth problem. So, here is a little secret let me let me tell you. If you take a non-smooth problem and more or less just run BFGS on it ok, more or less it works ok. You do not have to really really worry so much about these things. 99 percent of the times it works, but when it fails, it fails catastrophically. Right? So, you get this <laughs> you know it goes down in flames. So, what you really need and what you want to do is to fix that sort of you know. So, you want this kind of beautiful algorithm which converges super fast on 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 number of problems on a number of smooth problems. You want to get the same kind of behavior on non-smooth problems right and this is what we are we are interested in. So, let us first see what breaks down why why is does BFGS break down when you work with non-smooth functions. Okay. Sort of three things break down and we will systematically go and dissect each one of them. So, so the first thing is that your the quadratic approximation that you are making of your objective function is not well defined. The second thing is that your descent direction of course, is no longer you you cannot guarantee that you have a descent direction and then you need to modify the line search a little bit ok. So, these are three conditions let us go and dissect them little you know in more detail. So, what is the first thing? Let us look at the quadratic approximation right. So, again coming back to this model that we drew of the objective function before. So, you have a quadratic model. So, you say ok this is my this is how my locally I believe that the model is going to look like. Now, you you notice that this model uses the gradient ok. And suppose I am sitting at this point at this 0 at this kink point where there is no gradient ok. So, you can say oh you know why are you fretting so much about it just take a subgradient right. Take an arbitrary subgradient and be happy with life. Unfortunately, it does not work. Why? Because depending on which subgradient I choose, I get a different quadratic model. So, here are different uh, I do not know if it is hard to see, but basically you see for every va so he, at this point my subgradient is between 0 to 1. So, depending on which subgradient I choose, I get one of these models. So, I get this model, that model, that model and so on. So, sort of if I choose an arbitrary subgradient, what happens is my model becomes unstable. I mean it is not it is not reproducible like you know I could run BFGS and you could run BFGS, you chose a different S, I chose a different S, our trajectories would be completely different right. That is not that is a strict no no, you do not want to do some things like that. So, what do you do? You say ok, here is a way to fix it. Let us take all possible models that you can get at that point and sort of take their upper envelope. Okay, so, let us take this upper envelope. Now, you get a model which looks like this and it turns out you can prove that this model is not quadratic anymore, but it is piecewise quadratic. So, in other words for every sort of linear piece there is a quadratic approximation that is available ok. Now, it seems like we have we have traded one headache for another headache right. So, first how do you how do you define this kind of a model, how do you do the supremum over the subgradient set? You do not even know anything about the subgradient set. How are you going to do this? Again, this is where we will exploit the fact that we know about the objective function ok. So, let us play along with me for a while and then we will see we I will show you how this can be exploited ok. 
But let us say, suppose somehow I could do this. Then the next question to ask is that, okay, you have defined your model. How are you going to find a direction of descent? Okay, so natural question. To find my direction of descent, I have to go back to my model and say, okay, let me try exactly like what the quasi-Newton algorithms were doing. Let me take my locally, uh, you know, I call this the locally pseudo-quadratic approximation. But let me take this locally pseudo-quadratic approximation that I have and minimize this model. And so exactly like what we were doing and maybe perhaps hopefully something will come, up, come about. So this is what I am going to do. I am going to find my next iterate by minimizing this model. It is not even clear that I can do this. It is not even clear that I can compute this argument. Okay, but, uh, but you know, let us be brave and move on. Now I can rewrite this, this function of minimizing this model as the following. Okay, so this is again the standard trick from optimization. You remember we did this in SVMs in the other way. So we took the, the constraints into the objective. Now I'm, I am taking the objective into the constraints. Okay, so but same trick. Okay, so the, the, this, I introduce a new variable psi and I add a psi and take this part of the objective function and put it down here. Okay, same, same exactly the same trick except it is played with a different variables now. And this must hold for all subgradients which belong to the set. Ponder about it for a minute. If this is a set, okay, I want this constraint to hold for everything in the set. If this set had infinite elements, right? If it was countably infinite, like for instance, if you had an interval like before, okay, if you had an interval, this must hold for all values in the interval. What does that mean? Like you have infinite constraints. What are you going to do with the infinite constraints, right? How are you even able to? So it seems like we are going down a hopeless path. But it turns out that there is hope at the end of the tunnel. The way we are going to do is I am going to cheat. Okay? So the way I am going to cheat, you know, usual computer science trick. If you can't solve it, cheat. So the way I am going to cheat is by saying I am going to carefully select <coughs> a set of subgradients. So this comes back to the question that somebody was asking, can we sample the subgradients in the right way? So I'm going to carefully sample. I'm not going to sample randomly, mind you, okay? I haven't told you how I'm going to do the sampling, okay? But I'm going to carefully sample the set of subgradients such that I'll get k of them and somehow magically if I can ensure that this constraint is satisfied for k of them, then very likely I will find a direction of descent. This kind of seems magical. I still haven't told you how to sample. Okay, so now let's address the question of how to sample. But before that, I need to do an algebraic rewrite just to make things less messy. I'm just going to write w minus wt as this variable d, which is the direction, and then I, you know just simplify this thing. Okay. Now let's see this. This equation is what I want to solve. Okay. And then what I have to tell you to complete the picture is how am I going to carefully sample the subgradient? So how am I going to do this? It turns out that I can come up with an iterative scheme for sampling the subgradients. Okay? The way it works is that at every iteration, so you start from, you take some random, random subgradient, okay? and then you come up with a direction, okay? some random direction that you come up with at the beginning. Then this green step is a crucial step. Okay? It says, I assume this is an assumption, okay? So this is something that is not true in general for a black box convex function. But I assume that for the function that I am interested in, I can always compute sort of the worst subgradient in some sense. So what does it mean? That I take my direction and look at all subgradients in my set at that current uh, iterate and I can compute sort of the worst direction. If you paid attention to Manfred's lectures, okay, this is exactly similar to computing an oracle. Right? It's like I have a set of subgradients, my set of subgradients is like a weak learner, and I assume that there is a strong oracle which will tell me, I produce for it sort of a distribution, and it will tell me the worst violating subgradient. Exactly analogous thing is happening here that I'm assuming that I have a direction that I'm producing. So I propose a direction. There is an oracle. The oracle will give me the worst subgradient. Okay? This I cannot do in general. I, I, I want to stress this again and again. This I cannot do in general. 
but for the objective functions that we are working with because we know the functional form I can come up with such an oracle. Okay. So this is again a neat little uh, thing that, uh, that uh, you can think about for hinge loss especially you can do this. Okay. Now suppose I can find, suppose I assume that I have this oracle. What can I do? I check is my, am I done? Is the current direction that I am given and sort of the worst violating subgradient if the direction, if this dot product is less than 0, remember my condition from before? D is a direction of descent if and only if S times D is less than 0 for all S which belongs to the subgradient set. Since the oracle is giving me the worst subgradient, if this is less than 0, I am done. Happy? Go home, here is your direction. Okay. If not, then what I need to do is I need to take my dk plus 1. How do I do my dk plus 1? I take my this, this objective function that I had and I solve for it. Okay. I add, now I, I have one more constraint. Remember this is at every si is giving me one constraint. So I get one extra constraint. I throw it into this function. I minimize it and I get my next iteration. So this is almost identical. So if you, if you think for a minute, this is almost identical to boosting. Okay. In boosting, what do you do? There is an oracle which gives you the weak learner. You update your distribution. Then you go back to the oracle and keep going back and forth. Okay. This is like boosting with a, with a square norm regularizer. That's exactly what it is. You can show that it's exactly analogous. And by actually using this analog, uh, okay, before I go on, so you, you remember this discussion about totally corrective boosting versus corrective boosting? So I can do a corrective version of this update, okay? And this corrective version actually I can compute in closed form. It's pretty easy to compute, okay? And that's one of the nice things. I don't have to do the actual optimization. So if I do this corrective version, then I don't even have to solve a QP. These are all easy updates. And I can show rates of conversion. But again, for those of you who are really, really with me still, a lot has happened, but those of you who are still hanging on there, these rates of convergence are not the rates of convergence of the optimizer. This is simply saying how many subgradients do I need to sample in order to find a direction of descent. Okay? So that's a very subtle difference. So this is not the rates of convergence of the optimizer. This is simply saying, how many subgradients do I need to sample? Okay. What does epsilon mean in that case? Uh, in this case, you just here you you tolerate an epsilon in in the you know that's that's the epsilon. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Because you, you, you come up with a direction for, your, for the hinge loss, for instance, you know, so okay, the way it works is for the hinge loss, so you remember I told you that the subgradient, the subdifferential set is always convex. <laughs> for the hinge loss, you can say even more. You can say that the subdifferential set is a, is a um, what's the word? I always forget. The poly, um, it only has faces, it's a, it's a poly polytope. Sorry, yeah, that was the word. <laughs> so it is always a polytope. Okay? And now when you give a direction, usually the, the arc soup happens at one of the corners of the polytope. And there is a efficient, because your, your loss is written as a summation, sort of you can make that decision independently and you can very quickly zoom in on the right corner of the polytope that you want. In order and time, you can come up with uh, the, the right polytope like the right corner of the polytope. Sounds like a linear programming it's more or less a linear programming problem because it is, a, it is like a dot product and this set happens to be a polytope. But you don't, the, the point is you do not have to solve a linear programming problem because it decomposes. Sort of along every dimension you can make a decision independently. That is the important piece. If this was not the case, you'd have to solve a general purpose linear programming problem. And then it would become getting into horribly inefficient things because this is a LP, that is a QP. Just to find a direction of descent, you solve an LP and a QP. That's a lot of work. You don't want to do that. Okay. 
But yeah, in general, if you know that your loss is like if this set is is a polytope, it is an LP. But in our particular case, it's an even better poly, like it's a, it's even better than an LP. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There's no loss function here. Yeah. 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 So that's again the beautiful thing, right? This is not general purpose optimization. This is not optimization that you're doing for a black box function. This is optimization that you're doing for machine learning. Okay. And exactly where you you utilize this dot products. Okay. Now. Uh, yeah, so where, where are we? Okay, so now you can also modify the, the Wolf conditions for, for non-smooth functions. This turns out, again, this is just a technical thing. I, I don't want to spend as much time on this, but this is just a technical thing to show you that you can patch up the, the Wolf conditions. But for the hinge loss, actually something even nicer happens. Okay, the nice thing is, the, of course, if you look at the objective function, I just rewrote it for you. If you look at it along any direction, sort of at a high level, so this is also the intuition for why BFGS works so well. If you take any non-smooth function and look at it like at a zoomed view, right? I mean like a 30,000 feet view, the function more or less looks smooth. You don't even see the hinges, right? Where do you see the hinges? Only when you zoom in, like to like really, really low precision, like you go down very, very much, then you start seeing the effect of the hinges. So this is why sort of the BFGS approximation works because from a high level, any non-smooth function more or less looks smooth. So you can more or less assume and cheat that it's smooth. Only when you get very close to the optimum, the hinges matter. And I'll show you this effect more, more dramatically as we go along, okay? But the good news though, uh, uh, the reason I brought this up here is because if you know that your function looks, uh, because your function in this case is piecewise quadratic, okay? And then there is some clever so, uh, thing that you can do. You need to do a little bit of bookkeeping, but you can show that along any direction, okay? This, this is a, this is a one-dimensional piecewise quadratic function. Okay, so this is sort of the things that you do if uh, on, a, on, a, on a lazy Sunday afternoon when you have nothing else to do, you take a pen and pencil and sit down and draw a piecewise quadratic function and you think about how am I going to minimize this piecewise quadratic function in one dimension, okay? If you think for, uh, you know, long enough, you can actually come up with an exact algorithm for minimizing the quadratic, the piecewise quadratic. It's a, it's actually, it's a linear time algorithm. No, it's actually n log n time algorithm because there's a sort involved. So you do a sort and more or less you can compute it, okay? So this is again a nice little, little problem. You know, if you're just, if you're just feeling lazy on a Sunday afternoon and just don't want to watch TV and really do some work, this is a nice, thing to think. So take a, take a piecewise quadratic function, try to find its minimum, okay? It's very easy to do. And you can do an exact line search in linear time. Actually, uh, it's in expected linear time. You need, you need to do a sort, okay? So now let me show you the experiments and sort of also drive home this point of couple of points that I want to drive home with these experiments. The first point I want to drive home is this is a question that I keep frequently asked, especially by the referees. Why don't you just use BFGS and be done? Why don't you, why do you have to do all these modifications, uh, tweaks and all that stuff? Why do you need that? The reason for it is, you know, when BFGS works, it works dramatically well, actually. And it works almost as well as, as any of our algorithms. So the red line is our algorithms. Uh, I call it sub BFGS for BFGS, which is modified for subgradients. And then LBFGS LS is LBFGS, which does an exact line search. So, you know, you use an exact line search inside the LBFGS. And LBFGS ILS is LBFGS, which does an inexact line search. Okay, so not an exact. So you can see that when it works, right? So when BFGS works, more or less it converges at about the same rate as what we do. But when it doesn't work, like in this case, it, it fails dramatically. Here, of course, the inexact line search works, but it is quite slow. 
excuse me. The other problems where BFGS does not even start, I, I, I do not mention them here because they are multi class problems. So, there are certain multi class problems where if you start from w equals 0, BFGS will not even start at the first iteration before it takes its first step, it dies. Okay. So, therefore, you really need these, these uh, changes. Okay. You need to fix BFGS to work with, properly with subgradients. Now, let me show you again another sort of neat example which at least personally to me helped visualize a lot of what was happening. Okay. So, the, the function to keep in mind is this. So, it is a function which looks like this. Okay. So, it is a function which looks like this, but it has 10 times more curvature along one dimension than in the other. So, it is sort of more steep along one direction than it is on the, so it has some curvature here, but along this direction, this direction curvature is 10 times more than the curvature it has here. Okay? This kind of a function, if you run BFGS, it is really evil for it. I mean, it is you know, it really uh, has trouble. So, let us see what happens. So, I am switching to the top view. So, I am showing you from the top. We start from the corner. Okay. And if you run BFGS, it sort of goes from quadrant to quadrant to quadrant, sort of runs around, runs around, really, really, you know, takes time to get anywhere close to the optimum. The optimum is at 0. So, it is sort of runs around for hundreds of iterations without doing anything, okay, and really slow convergence. On the other hand, if you use this subgradient BFGS, you basically converge in 1, 2, chum, chum, okay. This, of course, a cooked up example to show what we can do. What happens in real life? The other thing that people ask me is, oh, so you do BFGS, is it really, what is the part that is giving you good convergence? Is it the line search or is it the direction finding procedure or is it really that are you benefiting from modeling the function with a quadratic? And so, this is a valid question to ask. Are you really gaining from the quadratic modeling. So, to test that, what we did is we just did, well, we call this GD, but this is basically subgradient descent. So, this is subgradient descent. So, you see it is more or less useless. It never gets to even good objective function values. Probably, it will get somewhere there after like a few years. Same thing here. Okay. And here is what we call sub GD. What sub GD does is it uses the direction finding procedure that I mentioned, but it does not do any modeling of the Hessian. So, it is basically gradient descent, but with this direction finding procedure. So, in subgradient descent, you cannot guarantee that you will always decrease your objective function value. Here, because I am using this procedure which will always give me a descent direction, it is guaranteed that it will dis decrease the objective function value. And again, you can see it does converge a little bit faster, but definitely nowhere near where we are. Okay? And here, on the other hand, BFGS, a sub L BFGS, more or less converges extremely fast. So, sort of it seems to indicate that we are really, really benefiting from knowing, making a quadratic approximation to the objective function. Okay. Now, comes the next slide. So, this is just again just to show that there is really some benefit. So, even though you have a piecewise linear function, this is just I think we took a random one of these uh, for, on one of these data sets, we took a random, uh, took one of these data sets, looked at a random direction and looked at plotted the BFGS quadratic model versus how the actual function looked like and you can see this is a pretty decent fit. Okay. How does it work in real, real life data? In real life data, this is on cover type, which is also some 500,000 examples. I think I also have, I do not know if I put RC, yeah, I think it is, this is RCV1. So, that is cover type. And of course, you know, the next question that must be burning in your mind is, okay, how does it compare to bundle methods? Are bundle methods better or should I be using quasi-Newton methods? It turns out that if you just use plain bundle methods, so if you just use BMRM straight, okay, you get some MR, I mean, you get, you get reasonable conversions, but BFGS pretty much does much faster. Okay? So, the same story comes here too. But there is one thing that really, really can be used to speed up BMRM, okay? to speed up bundle methods. That is, if you use 
bundle methods with an exact line search. So this was a paper that appeared um, almost simultaneously with ours. So all they did was they took bundle methods and applied exact line search. When you apply an exact line search, more or less you get pretty good convergence, okay? similar to BFGS. So sort of what is happening, the message I want to convey is that if you are given an objective function, you know things about it. The more you know about it, the more intimately you look at it and the more you throw specific things at it, you get better and better convergence. Okay? That is one message I want to convey. Another message I want to convey here is the following. So you will see this is, this is sort of true in, in many, of the, many of the other, I, I, I do not have too many of the experimental slides, again you can look up, there are some slides on my home page. When you look at the comparison between say bundle methods and sub BFGS, bundle methods take a long time initially. So they sort of start very slow, they have, the reason is clear because at the beginning you know nothing about the objective function, right? So you have to get a lot of subgradients before you sort of have a good model for how your function looks like, okay? So it takes a long time, they more or less stall at the beginning, they take a long time. But then when you get closer to the optimum, so in some sense once bundle methods have caught on and they know exactly how your objective function looks like, they zoom into the optimum very fast. They really, really go very fast to the optimum, okay? On the other hand, BFGS, sub-BFGS sort of starts ultra fast, more or less like zooms in close to the range of the optimum. But once it gets closer to the optimum, it more or less stalls, okay? The same thing happens here too. So it zooms in, but then it more or less stalls, okay? The reason for it is because when you look at an objective function, okay, initially the approximation that you make, this quadratic approximation that you're making of the objective function is a pretty good fit because like I showed you, if you remember this figure that I showed you, if you look at it at a high level, right, nobody would even, I mean if you just plotted this and showed this to your advisor, he wouldn't even realize that you're solving a non-smooth problem. Only when you would show him this, he would say, oh, well, maybe there's a problem, okay? So this is the issue, okay? So it initially, the quadratic approximation is a very, very good fit. But closer to the optimum, it's really the hinges that matter. So, you know, you sort of really need to know what's happening in the hinges. If you make a global approximation like what BFGS makes, it's not as good. On the other hand, bundle methods take, make very slow progress at the beginning because they spend a lot of time figuring out how the function looks like. But towards the end, they zoom into the solution very fast. Okay, so and we did some experiments actually. This is a fun experiment where we did a hybrid between bundle methods and LBFGS. Uh, seems to work very well. It's still very preliminary work. I don't have anything um, to report here. And there's another open issue. So this is so while this is all nice and this is all very recent work, there are still a few very open issues that you can you can solve. This is an issue that you could almost write a PhD thesis on, is the following issue. So some of you remember the structured loss, losses that Dale Sherman talked about towards the end of his lecture, so where you combine graphical models with support vector machines. It turns out that say for, for binary, multi-class, multi-label, all these kind of problems, I can do an exact line search, okay, in a rather cheap manner. But if I give you a structured prediction problem, it seems extremely hard to do a line search. It seems very, it seems it's a very, uh, it's something that is, that is intriguing because, you know, this is, a, this is a question that you'd want to ask in general when you're building a model. What happens if I take this parameter I take this parameter and if I perturb it slightly, if I move it in a, in a slight direction, like in a, in a particular direction, what happens to the model, right? It turns out I can answer this question for binary multi-class and hinge losses, but it's very hard to answer for structured losses. There is a, there is a beautiful paper by Pachter and Strumpfels which talks about this in the context of hidden marker models, but this is not about, they don't talk about what happens in, when you do a, when you, take a particular direction. They talk more about what happens when you perturb in a, in a region, but they use very advanced concepts from algebraic geometry to do that. But this is, this is 
by itself a PhD thesis if you are interested in this kind of, if, you're, if you like the interplay between algorithms, algebraic geometry, graphical models, machine learning, this is a really, really good question to ask. So structure losses are losses which actually have exponential, so roughly the way to describe it is they have exponentially many hinges in them. Like you know, if you have a CRF, a CRF is a structured loss, a conditional random field, uh, like a linear chain CRF is a, is a structure loss. So in fact, that is, that is the intriguing part about it, right? I can perform inference on a linear chain CRF in basically linear time, but I cannot answer this question. So if I tell you that, I give you a parameter, you run Viter V forward, backward, in linear time, but if I tell you, if I move the parameter a little bit in a certain direction, what happens to the result of Viter B? It's a hard problem. I do not know. I mean, I know of some hints of how this can be solved, but I do not know. It's an it's a, it's a extremely hard problem, something that you could spend your, basically, a few years on. Okay, questions? So either I completely raised <laughs> through. Okay. And again, this is uh, the, the, uh, the main uh, work appeared in JMLR. Actually, no, this is now appeared. I'm sorry, I should have made myself. So this, is, this appeared in JMLR in 2010, late 2010, and a short version appeared at ICML 2008. Okay? Um, and again, you know, there is, so I, I just want to uh, conclude by, by just a personal, uh, like, uh, a personal view on things that we are, as we go to more and more complicated models, right, or as we go towards more and more data, both dimensions, right? So machine learning is pushing along two frontiers. So on one end, there are all these people who are building complicated models, and on the other frontier, there are people at Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, who are pushing towards, let's take simple models, but get them to work on large scale data. In both cases, eventually, they all boil down. I mean, this is again my very biased personal view, that eventually it all boils down to doing the optimization right. So can you do the optimization in the right way? Can you take advantage of your hardware? Can you take advantage of your objective function? Can you take advantage of your model? What sort of errors can you tolerate in your model? What sort of inefficient, I mean, what, where can you cut corners in the right way, in the clever way? That is a deep question. There's many, many, many answers waiting, and many, many, many ICML NIPs and JMLR papers waiting to be written on this topic. Thank you very much. Um, Oh, and uh, I just want to uh, say one more thing. I actually had one more lecture, so I went very slow, but I actually had one more lecture where I talked about, or where I was planning to talk about um, the, the interplay between online learning and dual coordinate descent and how they are connected and they're basically one and the same in, in, some, in some weird sense. Uh, I don't know if there is any interest in doing that at 3, 3 p.m. <laughs> I could actually do it. Yeah. Is, there, is there interest? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, how many vote yes? Ooh, <laughs> okay, yeah, let's do it at 3 p.m. Thanks. <laughs>